The next thing I would like to discuss with y'all is Texas demography. The population of Texas has grown and changed rapidly in the last 160 years. In 1850, the population was 2, 000, excuse me, 210,000. In 1990, oh, the Texas population had grown just a tad bit. We were up to 17 million people. Most of this was thanks to the strong economy of the state. In 2010, Texas had 25.1 million people. Now what I want you to realize is, why am I able to give you this population count? What is, what is the same about the years that I am giving you? 1850, 1990, 2010. Why am I able to tell you the population of those years? That's right. It's the census year. Every 10 years, the United States conducts a census. They are required to. This is in regards to representation in the House and making sure resources are divided appropriately. But 10 years, census, it's going to be important later on in the session, in the semester. We see that there are three other factors that account for population growth in the 1990s other than the economy. The first one, different birth rates relative to death rates. What I mean is, thanks to medical advancements, we had more children living through childhood. So thanks to immunizations, these kind of things. More kids were living to adulthoods. And thanks to these same medical advancements, or thanks to the same reason, we see individuals who are leading longer lives. You know, it used to be that the life ex expectancy was, I want to say, 75 years. Now it's like up to 84 for an Anglo male. So, yeah, so we have lower, more, lower infant mortality rates, lower childhood death rates, and we are living longer thanks to medical advancements. So that's the first reason. The second reason is international immigration. What does international mean? Inter, I-N-T-E-R, means that it's coming from outside. International immigration is coming from outside of the United States. Where are we getting this immigration from? Well, a lot of it is coming from Mexico, but we are getting a number of immigrants from the Middle East, from Pakistan, from India, from Africa. So we are getting immigrants from all other countries in the world. Three, the third reason, if number two was international immigration, number three is intranational immigration coming from inside the United States. We see a number of people moving from the other 49 states to Texas thanks to our low cost of living, thanks to our economy. So these are three factors other than the economy that have helped us increase our population. Now I want to start looking at race and or ethnicity. Anglos. Anglos were the dominant ethnic group in Texas until the 21st century, so until now. European Anglos settled in Texas because of the availability of cheap land. The wave of Anglos who came to Texas brought different values with them and they transform the political culture. By the 1950s, 74% of the Texas population, so by 1950, 74% of the Texas population identified as Anglo. By 2010, that number has reversed. It is now 47%. So 74 in the 50s to 47% in 2010. Hispanic. 
Most Hispanics in Texas are of Mexican descent. In the early 19th century, about 5,000 people of Mexican descent were living in Texas. The Hispanic population has fluctuated over the years, but recent estimates suggest that the Hispanic population stands at about 9.5 million. Initially, most migrant Hispanics worked as laborers in the cotton and the ranch economy. However, after World War II, changes in discriminatory labor laws allowed Hispanics to take jobs in the growing Texas urban areas. This means they were able to leave the rural areas, leave the farm and ranches, come to the urban areas, come to the cities. We see that the political status of Hispanics has changed significantly over time. Various barriers prevented Hispanics from participating in the political system. Only after World War II did the political status of Hispanics improve as we begin to see Hispanic politicians assume positions of importance in these urban areas, in these cities. We start to see groups join together, or groups form, not join, groups form to aid Hispanics in overcoming these discriminatory practices and trying and in trying to to gain in political power. We have the La Raza Unida Party, Unida Party. La Raza. This confronted the discriminatory practices that they faced. We have LULAC, League of United Latin American Citizens. We have MALDEF, Mexican Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. These were all groups that formed together. That these were people that banded together in an attempt to fight the discriminatory, te discriminatory practices in Texas and to make sure Hispanics gained in status and power. Were they successful? Mm, yeah, they were. By the 1980s, the Hispanic population played a major role in state politics. They were actively courted by both parties, both the Republicans and the Democrats, won the Hispanic vote. Who won? We, we can actually declare a winner because we know traditionally Hispanics vote for which party. Yes, Hispanics traditionally vote Democrat, so we could say the Democrats won the Hispanic vote. Starting in the 1980s, back to this, we see that Hispanics have increased their presence in elected office. In 2010, in the census in 2010, Hispanics accounted for 37% of the population of Texas. African Americans. Most African Americans entered Texas as slaves. By the end of the Civil War, over 182,000 slaves lived in Texas. Well, by, freed slaves lived in Texas about one-third of the population. While African Americans in Texas were emancipated on June 19, 1865, did equality exist? They were, they were freed, officially freed, June 19, 1865. How was life on June 20th, 1865? Was it better? No, it wasn't. It was the same. We saw black codes were passed by local governments and the legislature to restrict the form of the rights of former slaves. Saw so these black codes, we saw these Jim Crow laws. We went out of our way to ensure that African Americans were not allowed to participate in government, that they were not allowed to exercise the rights they were given. We do see that African Americans had some opportunities during Reconstruction. So this was the 1860s. But their improved status was reversed when Democrats came back into power in the 1870s. Starting in the 1870s, segregation becomes a guiding principle of policy making. Segregation is okay according to, to government. 
In the 1940s, the 1950s, federal court decisions do bring some relief. They do make an effort to end segregation. We see that the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, helped open up the political system to African Americans. Today, the African American population is concentrated in East Texas as well as the urban centers of Dallas and Houston. We see that African American political leaders have come to play a major political role in the state's politics, so we are seeing more African Americans elected. Uh, once again, both parties pursued the African American vote. Which party won the African American vote? African American vote? The Democrats. So traditionally, women, traditionally minorities vote Democrat. In 2010, African Americans made up 11% of the Texas population. I sat here and included a link, Texas predicted population growth. Play with this. You can see it produces state and county level projections through 2050. So we can look at household projections, labor force, enrollment in education, enrollment in community colleges, universities, race, gender, age. So this is just kind of fun to play with. Majority. What is the definition of majority? Is it the most? Kind of. That, that might not be a true definition of majority. There's a better definition of majority. The true definition of majority is 50% plus 1. The majority is 50% plus 1. Well, what's the difference between that and the most? The most doesn't have to be 50%. If you look at the numbers that I gave you, the, the racial background for Anglos, Hispanics, and African Americans, in, according to the census in 2010, Anglos were 40%, or 47%, Hispanics 37%, African Americans 11%. If you see a question that says, According to lecture, which race slash ethnicity has a majority in Texas or was a majority in Texas in 2010? Anglo, Hispanic, African American, none of the above. The answer is none of the above. Anglos, we don't have a majority. We have 47%. Instead, what we have is something called a plurality. A plurality. Plurality is the most, but it's not a majority. I want you to know this term. You will hear it again in this lecture. Age. Texas is one of the youngest states in the Union. And what I mean by this is, if we're talking about the age of Texans under 25, or excuse me, under 18, compared to the national rate, Texas, we have about a 30% population under the age of 18. Nationally, that's about 24%. So we do have a higher population of people under the age of 18. Poverty and wealth. We see that Texas population tends to be poorer than the rest of the nation. 
even with our economic gains in the 1990s, Texans still, or Texas, still lags behind much of the country in per capita income. We ranked about 29th out of 50 states. Now, this is true. It can't be denied. We did rank that low. However, I per capita might not be the best factor to use. And I say that because what is per capita income? Per capita income is what the average Texan brings home, what the average Texan makes per year. Let me ask you a question. If you make $60,000 a year and you live in Houston, you live in Dallas, can you live comfortably? I mean, you'll be able to rent an apartment, you'll be able to buy a house, have a car note, have food, pay for your utilities, go out and entertain. Yeah, you can live comfortably. If you make $65,000 a year and you live in New York, you live in somewhere in California, what can you afford? One of the nicer boxes on, on the block in the street corner? I mean, what? You know, Texas, we don't have to pay as much because we have a lower cost of living. And that has a large effect on the amount that we pay. So, yeah, we are one of the poorer states, but I really think that this per capita income is a, is a poor factor to use. Urbanization. Urbanization is defined as the process by which people move from rural areas to cities. Luckily, well, I say luckily, depending on which book you use, all of these textbooks say that we believe most urbanization in Texas has already occurred. And what, now I get to the textbooks. Anywhere, whichever textbook says anywhere from 83 to 88% of the people already live in urban areas. So urbanization has finished. Now we are going through a process called suburbanization. Suburbanization. This is simply the process by which people move from central city areas to surrounding areas. So we are leaving the Houston area, the Dallas area, the San Antonio, Austin area, wherever, and we're moving out to the suburbs. However, I do want to talk about some of these cities. I want to talk about a couple of things we do find in Houston. The first is the urban political economy. Well, the urban political economy, this is simply the interrelations between politics and the economy, as well as the effect on each other, is reflected in the comparison of its three major, major metropolitan areas. So let's look at these three major areas, see what caused them to succeed. The first, Houston. Houston is the largest city in Texas and the fourth largest city in the U.S. Who's, th who's number three? Chicago. After the 2010 census, or excuse me, after the 2020 census, it is expected that Houston will become number three. Houston will pass Chicago up in population. If you include Houston surrounding areas, Houston's population was almost 6.1 million in 2010. What we see is that economic dream, so this entrepreneurship, segregation, unfortunately, but cotton, commerce, railroads, and then oil all shaped the city's history. With the emergence of the petrochemical industry, so oil and gas, Houston became one of the leading energy centers in the world. Census data from 2010 
says that Anglos account for 28.3% of the population, Hispanics 42.4%, and African Americans 22.2%. Dallas, Fort Worth, DFW. The DFW Metroplex includes Dallas, Fort Worth, and other smaller cities. The Metroplex is joined by interlocking highways. It has an international airport. Houston has two. The railroad, transportation, communication, once again, entrepreneurship, cotton, cattle, oil, manufacturing, and high-tech industries have all shaped the history of the area. I can't explain why, but for some reason, entrepreneurship, you know, opening your own business, going to business for yourself, this seems to be more successful up in the Dallas area than in the Houston area. Not sure why, just it is. If you want to open up your own business, go up to the Dallas area. You have a better chance of success. Last one, San Antonio. Here's an odd fact. What's the biggest city, the second biggest city in Texas? We know Houston's number one. What's the second biggest, Dallas, Fort Worth, or San Antonio? Would you believe that San Antonio is actually the second largest city? According to 2010, their, prox uh, their population was approximately 1.32 million. This isn't going to last, but as of the last census, it's the biggest. The economy in San Antonio is built on military bases, education, tourism. There is some medical research complex, some medical research complexes there, so there is a little bit of medical researches, research occurring. However, what we see that San Antonio lacks the high-tech industrial jobs that Houston has, that Dallas has. Therefore, this means that San Antonio is actually going to have a lower per capita income. All in all, Texas is one of the fastest growing states in the nation, and it has a very diverse cultural mix and economy. Anybody know what the fastest growing segment of the Texas culture is? Yes, it's Hispanic Texans. Texas, the beginning. Let's talk about the way things used to be. Culture. As more settlers were drawn to Texas due to cheap land. Where are these settlers coming from? And this is going to be really confusing unless we just sit here and take a deep breath and think about this. Texas, we were settled by, or we belong to, Mexico. When we talk about immigrants coming to Texas, where are these immigrants coming from? They're coming from the United States. It's these European settlers that came to the U.S., and then they moved into Texas. So as more settlers were drawn to Texas due to these cheap land, as we see more European, those of European descent come in, the Latino and Native American culture is replaced. English, Scotch-Irish becomes the dominant culture. Women. Women, you had, I say you had very few rights in Texas. Really, you only had one. Any, any idea what right that was? It was a big one, though. You only had one, but it was important. Spanish law allowed women to own property. However, you could not vote or, or you could not serve on juries. But this is a discussion for a later, later lecture. Factions versus parties. Political parties did not exist when Texas is a 
territory of Mexico when Texas first becomes a nation. We don't have political parties, however, we do have feuding factions. The first faction is the pro-Houston faction. They wanted annexation for Texas. They wanted us to be annexed by the United States. They didn't want us to become our own nation when we, wore, when we got our independence from Mexico. They wanted us to have peace with the Native Americans. Who do you think led the, the pro-Houston faction? Sam Houston, that was the leader. If we have the pro-Houston faction, they, they want us to be annexed, they want Texas to be a state, they want to have peace with the Indians, the Native Americans, what do you think the other faction is called? This is the 1830s, we're not very original. If we have the pro-Houston faction, then we have the anti-Houston faction. The anti-Houston faction, they wanted Texas to become its own nation. They did not want to be annexed by the United States. They wanted the eradication of the Native Americans. They wanted manifest destiny, this westward expansion. They wanted test Texas to expand its territory westward to the Pacific Ocean. We see that Texans actually voted for annexation into the United States in 1836. We wanted to become a state, but we were not allowed into the Union until 1845. The United States did not invite us in. Why? One reason, one reason only. Texas was what is called a slave state. Slavery was legal in Texas. Slavery was also legal in the United States at this time, but the government was trying to keep a balance between slavery issues and non-slavery issues. They were trying to keep a balance between the slave states and the non-slave states in government. If they would have allowed Texas to come in in 1836, that would have shifted the balance of power to the slave states and, and the federal government. So slavery was the reason why we had to eight, we had to wait to 1845. We actually see these factions continue to feud, continue to fight up till the 1860s. Sam Houston, at this point, Governor Houston, wanted Texas to stay in the Union. He did not want us to secede. The secessionist forces wanted Texas to join the Confederacy. How did that turn out? Yeah, we voted to leave the Union. We joined the Confederacy. Political progress. Have things changed? Yeah, they have. Women. What rights did women have when Texas became a nation? What did I tell you a minute ago? Women could vote. Or excuse me. No, they couldn't. What am I thinking? I'm sorry. Women had the right to own property. Now, let's get here. What rights do women have today? They can own property. They can vote. They can serve on juries. We have seen women have an increase in political power, have an increase in rights. I am going to focus the next minute or so on voting rights for women. From 1914 to 1918, we, Texas, had a governor who nicknamed himself Farmer Jim. His real name was Jim Ferguson. Farmer Jim was kind of a jerk. He did not believe, he like, and honestly, he like numerous men of the time, did not believe that women should be allowed to vote. They thought that voting would be too mentally stressful for women and they couldn't handle the stress it would place upon them. But Farmer Jim, Jim Ferguson, he was impeached and convicted of illegal use of public funds. So he was removed from office. 
So we get Farmer Jim out, Farmer Jim who was against women's suffrage, who was against women's voting. And we replace him with a person. The new governor is William P. Hobby Sr. William P. Hobby Sr. Governor Hobby is more receptive to women's suffrage. He is more receptive to women voting. He believes that women can handle the so-called stress of voting. And it is under Governor Hobby's leadership that Texas becomes the first southern state to ratify the 19th Amendment, to ratify the amendment that eventually gives women the right to vote. Since women gained the right to vote, have women made progress in running for office? Have women used this voting power to elect other women? In the executive branch, the answer is going to be no, unfortunately. How do we know this? What causes us to say this? Well, it's simply the fact that throughout Texas history, if you look at all of our governors, we've only had two female governors. The first was the 1920s. Her name was Miriam, nickname Ma Ferguson. Does that name sound familiar to you? Did we just talk about a Ferguson? Yes. This was the wife of Farmer Jim. You got it. We elected her. We elected the wife of an impeached governor to be governor. The last one, the most recent, was 1990s, and this was Governor Ann Richards. We see that women were, so y'all got the right to vote, the 19th Amendment, 1920, and women were given the right to serve on juries in 1954. Minorities. Most textbooks say Texas is a Texas was a racist state. I don't agree with that verbiage. I don't agree with that wording. I think Texas still is a racist state. How did minorities attempt to overcome this racism? They attempted to overcome this racism by forming groups, uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, LULAC, La Raza, MALDEF, I talked about the Hispanic groups earlier. They founded these groups and started to use the court as a way to combat the racism that they faced. I want to go over some court cases now. Uh, you need to know these court cases, what they do. Nixon versus Herndon. There's a Supreme Court decision, and you can read about it and their thought process. In Nixon versus Herndon, it starts in 1924. In this case, Texas was prohibiting African Americans from voting in election primaries, particularly the Democratic primary. What was the big deal about not being able to vote in the Democratic primary? Remember, up till the 1990s, Democrats controlled government. They controlled the executive branch. If you voted in the Democratic primary, you had a chance to vote for the winner. If you voted in the Republican primary, you were voting for a loser. That's the way it was. But Mr. Nixon is, pre is pre uh, prevented from voting in the election primaries, he sues. He states this is a violation of his 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law, and 15th Amendment, which freed, which said freed African American males had the right to vote. So he says that state that Texas cannot prohibit African Americans from voting in primaries, based on on these two amendments. The Supreme Court, in their decision, they say, Mr. Nixon, you are absolutely right. This is a violation of the, your 14th and 15th Amendment. 
government cannot violate Texas, you have to allow African Americans to vote. How does Texas react to this? Man, we're not real happy. We're not real pleased. So, as we're slowly coming back to Texas, we're making our way back and we're mulling over this decision and how we can get around it. And we start to have the beginnings of an idea. The Supreme Court said that government cannot discriminate. Okay, this, this sounds reasonable. Government can't discriminate. So we get back to Texas. The Democratic Party says, Texas, how did it go? The Supreme Court. Texas says, we lost. Supreme Court said we couldn't discriminate against African Americans. The Democratic Party said, well, sorry to hear that. Texas said, me too. But, Democratic Party, we need a favor. Democratic Party says, sure, anything. What, what do you need? Texas says, Democratic Party, we want you to take over the primary elections. Democratic Party says two things. First off, they say, yeah, sure, we can do this. Second thing they say is, African Americans, you're not allowed to vote in the Democratic primary. This leads us to Grovey v. Townsend. Once again, the Supreme Court decision is here. This is the 1930s. Mr. R. R. Grovey, Grovey an African American, he attempts to vote in the Democratic primary election. He is refused. He sues on the grounds that this is a violation of his 14th and 15th Amendment. So he sued under the, re the same reason Nixon did. Case goes to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court says, Mr. Grovey, you're absolutely correct. This is a violation of your 14th and 15th Amendment. But... We know what's coming with but, nothing good. But the Constitution only prevents the government from discriminating. The Democratic Party, in and of itself, is a private entity. This means that they are allowed to discriminate. So once again, African Americans are not allowed to to vote, to participate in the Democratic primary. Smith versus All Right, Supreme Court, dis dis our discussion. This is the case it overturns Grovey versus Townsend. This is the case that tells Texas you have to, to let African Americans vote in the Democratic primary. Basically, what the court says, or the court reasoned, is that the rule restricting primary voters to, to Anglos denied Smith equal protection under the law in violation of the 14th Amendment. By deleg by deleg by delegating, I'm sorry, by delegating its authority to the Democratic Party to regulate its primaries, the state was allowing discrimination to be practiced, which is unconstitutional. The court said, you know, the primaries are such an integral part of government even if it's being run by a private party. It is being run according to law created by the government. We are electing people to be put into the government. So basically this by proxy is government. Since it is by proxy, the party cannot discriminate. So Smith versus Allwright is the one that finally says Texas, you have to let African Americans vote. Are things good? Are things okay? 
Was this the end of discrimination in Texas? No, not yet. Next case, Sweat versus Painter. Here's a Supreme Court decision. In Sweat versus Painter, in 1946, Herman Sweat, an African American, applied for admission to the University of Texas Law School. Why does he want to go to UT Law? UT Law School is the most prestigious law school. It is the best law school in the state. He applies to UT Law. Can you guess what his answer is? If you said, uh, I bet you he didn't get in because he was African American, you would be absolutely correct. So, Mr. Sweat sues. He asked the state courts, he asked the courts to order his admission, but the university, they have something else in mind. At this time in the 1940s, remember what it, the guiding principle for the United States, what, what is the idea of segregation? Is it okay? Yes or no? Starting in 1896 in the Supreme Court decision Plessy v. Ferguson, we see segregation is okay. We get this separate but equal doctrine. Segregation is okay as long as the segregated group has access to the same thing as the Anglos. If you think about some of these old black and white pictures, you may have seen pictures of uh, water faucets, water fountains. One would say white only, one would say colored only. On, under Plessy v. Ferguson, under the separation but equal idea, separate but equal idea, this was totally okay. So this is what UT is using. This is what the University of Texas is using as a defense. Separate but equal. We can segregate because we don't have to let him into our school because next year we are going to open up a law school specifically for African Americans. So he will be able to go to a different school. He will be able to pursue his law degree. He will have access to faculty, books, all this good stuff. Separate but equal, it will be the same thing. Does this admission scheme, does them saying that there's going to be a school for African Americans that's going to provide the equal opportunities that we do, does this pass muster? Or does this Texas admission scheme violate the equal protection clause of, that we find in the 14th Amendment? In a unanimous decision, the court held, the court decided that the equal protection clause required that Mr. Sweat be admitted to the university. The court discovered, or the court found, that this law school for African Americans, which was to have opened in 1947, would have been grossly unequal to the University of Texas Law School. The court argued that the separate school would be inferior in a number of areas. This could include faculty, the course variety, the library, the, uh, the facilities, legal writing opportunities, and overall, the prestige. The prestige would be lower. What the court said was that mere separation from the majority of law students actually harmed, harmed, excuse me, actually harmed a student's ability to complete, uh, compete in the legal arena. So we see the Supreme Court tell UT, you have to desegregate. Hernandez versus the state of Texas. This is the last case you need to know about. There's a case decision by the Supreme Court. 
this is the first and only Mexican-American civil rights case that was heard and decided by the United States Supreme Court during the post-World War II period. In 1950, Peter Hernandez, a migrant cotton picker, was found guilty of murdering Joe Espinosa in Edna, Texas. Hernandez's attorney, Gustavo Garcia, appealed the guilty verdict to the Supreme Court by arguing that the 14th Amendment guarantees protection not only on the basis of race, but also class. See, this came about because Mr. Hernandez's jury, this jury of his peers, convicted of all, or was, was made up of all Anglos. There was not a single Hispanic on this jury. And further research showed that Hispanics had not served on a felony jury in, this was Edna, Texas, this was Jackson County. No Hispanic had served on, a, on any type of jury in Jackson County for the previous 25 years. So Mr. Garcia, the attorney for Mr. Hernandez, is arguing that the state of Texas is violating the 14th Amendment because they are making Hispanics a second class, well, they're treating them as second class citizens. It doesn't only have to deal with race, it has to do with how they're treated. So they're tre being treated as second class citizen. The state of Texas argues the 14th Amendment covered only Anglos and African Americans and that Mexican Americans are white. Now, the state did admit that no person with a Spanish surname had served on a jury, any type of jury, for 25 years in Jackson County, but they had, an, a, had a reason. They, there is a, a simple reason why not. Why not. It says, it was just a coincidence. It's not a pattern, it's not an attitude, it's not a behavior. It's just a coincidence that no Hispanic has served on a jury in Jackson County in 25 years. No, no, the court didn't go for that. The court accepts this concept of distinction by class and said that when laws produce unreasonable and different treatment on such a basis, the constitutional guarantee of equal protection the constitutional guarantee of equal, 14th Amendment equal protection under the law is violated. So this tell, says you cannot treat a minority as a, a, whole, a whole minority group as a separate class. Education. Education has been important to Texas. And we see that this has been illustrated since the first Constitution covering Texas. Two things I'm going to mention here. The first is that after World War I, we see our first real progressive movement in regards to education. After World War I, we pass, we being Texas, passed a constitutional amendment that's going to provide free textbooks for public school children. Why is this a big deal? Guys, y'all are college students. Why would free textbooks be a big deal? Exactly. Textbooks are expensive. And think about it. After World War I, 1920s, we're still an agricultural society. We're still a poor society. Most families have three, four, maybe five kids. They might be making a dollar a week. If they had to buy textbooks for three kids earning a dollar a week, could they have afforded it? No. So this was a big deal. This was our first progressive movement. Our next progressive movement comes in the 1980s. This is a three-prong movement. This comes under Governor Mark White. The first prong, the first provision enacted, 
something called no pass, no play. We figure that school is a place for education and not to have fun, so that if you want to participate in extracurricular activities, you have to pass all of your classes. This starts in the mid-80s. Is this still in effect today? Yes, it is. So this has lasted how long now? 35, about 35 years. The next prong, the next provision, is called no pass, no teach. We want to hold students responsible, but we also want to hold teachers responsible. We want to make sure teachers are fit, they are qualified to teach in their area. So no pass, no teach, we start requiring teachers to take a content test, to take a test to show that they have base knowledge to teach in their area. What happens if they fail the test? They can't teach. Finally, the third one, this is another court case. It's called Edgewood versus Kirby. This starts in 89, it ends in the 90s. This deals with equality in school funding. This is better known as the Robin Hood plan. This was an effort to make sure all schools in Texas were funded equally. So that was our last big progressive movement. Parties. <clears throat> Please remember that for over 100 years, Texas was a one-party state. Starting in 1873, uh, this was in response to the Republican governor that was forced upon us by the North, by the federal government. This would have been Governor E.J. Davis. So starting in 73, Texas voted Democrat for every state office. Remember, or what you're going to learn, is that the Republicans in charge of the North, so the, the Republicans at the federal level, wanted to punish the South for succeeding. And this is why Texas voted Democrat. So we see Democrats gain power very quickly, very easily. And they're able to maintain this power due to the political repression. We talked about Nixon v. Herndon, Grovey v. Townsend. But as we're going through Texas history, as we're going through the 1900s, we start to see some issues. We start to see some chinks in the party armor. The first occurs during something called the Tidelands Controversy. The Tidelands Controversy deals with oil. Oil was found off the coast of Texas. Of course, Texas claims the land that oil was found on because they wanted the money. Well, somebody else wants that oil money too, the federal government. So the federal government decides to lay claim to this land. They say, Texas, no, this is found on federal land. This is federal oil. You don't get any of it. Texas, we are mad. We can't believe that the federal government and at this point, the federal government is being run by the Democratic Party. We can't believe that the federal government wants these tidelands, that they want our oil. And this actually became a big deal. We see that there were three Supreme Court decisions that went against the states. There were three acts of Congress in favor of the states two presidential vetoes against the states, and it was a major issue in a presidential campaign before the federal government said, Texas, you know what, keep your oil. Keep the Tidelands oil. It's yours. You're not worth it. So finally, Texas wins the, wins the victory. Are we happy? Yes. Are we truly happy? No. 
Texans, are we the type to forgive and forget? Mm, no. You know, the Supreme Court says, take the oil. It's yours. We're done. And Texas says, yeah, you're right. We'll take the oil because it is ours. But we are mad at the federal government. We are mad at the Democrats for doing this, for trying to take our oil. So under, under a guy by the name of Governor Alan Shivers, we see the creation of what we call Shivercrats. Shivercrats are Democrats who would vote Democrat at the state and the local level, but they, vote, they started to vote Republican at the federal level in retaliation to the federal government and their action regarding the Thailand's controversy and reaction guarding, regarding their oil grab. So even after the Thailand's controversy, Democrats still control the state, but their grasp is slipping. In 1972, Governor Dolph Briscoe is elected. He's a Democrat, so this should not have been a surprise. However, what is surprising is that for the first time, a Democrat is elected governor without a majority vote. Remember I told you a few minutes ago you needed to know majority, you needed to know plurality. Plurality was the most, but not a majority. For our, our state officials, you have to win by plurality. You don't have to win by a majority. So with Governor Briscoe in 72, for the first time, yeah, the Democrats won, but they got a plurality. They did not get a, a majority. This is a sign that things are changing. 1979, we're having our election. The Democrat or the Republicans are trying to to figure out who they're going to run. So they asked this guy by the name of William P. Clemens, "Hey, you want to run for governor in 1979?" William Clemens says, sure, why not? An amazing thing happens November of 79. Clemens wins. William P. Clemens becomes the first Republican elected to the governor's office since E.J. Davis when he left in 1873. 106 years. Republicans are ecstatic. They think they've made it to the promised land. We're back. We're important. We're relevant. Guess what? Are Republicans back? Are they important? Are they relevant? No, what Republicans are, are wrong. Governor Clemens is defeated by Governor White. In 1983, Governor White, Democrat. But things are changing again. At our next election, Governor White's running for re-election. Republicans are, are looking around, looking for somebody to run. Republicans say, hey, Billy, Billy Clemens, you want to run again? Clemens says, sure, why not? What do I got to lose? So candidate Clemens, William P. Clemens, is running against Governor Mark White, the guy who beat him. What do you think happens? Clemens gets reelected. He defeats Governor White. So now he, we have elected another Republican, but it's the same Republican. We have now put another Republican in the governor's mansion. Republicans are excited. We're back. We're important. We're relevant. Republicans are wrong. Governor Clemens does his four-year term. He runs against this, Demo this Democratic candidate, a woman by the name of Ann Richards. 
Candidate Richards defeats the incumbent governor. Candidate Richards becomes Governor Richards. She serves her four-year term. Republicans are once again looking for somebody to run against, uh, against Richards. So finally, their eyes settle around the Dallas, the Arlington area. Got this businessman up there. Owns a baseball team. Kind of slow. Comes from the north, but he's lived here for a while. I, I, I don't know. Maybe you've heard of him. A guy by the name of George Bush. Hey, George, you want to run for governor? George says, sure, why not? So he goes in and he runs against Governor Richards. And he wins. Republicans win again. Republicans are excited. Man, we won the governor's mansion. We're back. We're important. We're relevant. Republicans are right this time. We see that Republicans, when they take over every statewide office in 1998, so they control the entire executive branch, and in 2002, the Republican Party gains control of both chambers of the Texas legislature. They gain control of both the Texas House and the Texas Senate, cementing their power, their control over Texas government. So what I said earlier is a number of you did not know that the Democrats controlled Texas for so long simply because it was before your time. Y'all didn't know that the Democrats controlled Texas for over a hundred years. The Republicans have only controlled Texas. They were elected November of 2002. They were put into office January of 2003. So they've only controlled Texas politics since 2003. Now, I know this seems like a long time, but Politically speaking, you know, 16 years, 20 years, 25 years even. Is that a long time? No, actually, not really. So the Republicans have not been in control of Texas for that long.